Alrighty, and we are live once again. So I'm not going to speak anything about hiatuses. I feel like it's bad luck at this point to even speak about a hiatus. But uh, I recently am in the middle of moving, um, needless to say. So, of course, life never goes the way you want it to. And you kind of have to move and shake. And in this theme of changing things up, of switching things up, um, I'm going to start another series today or kind of like a mini series, maybe a longer one. But this is supposed to be an introduction to a full length uh, look into how life would adapt potentially to other worlds, how life would get started on other worlds. But in order to kind of go with that first, what I have to do is break down what we have so far. And what we have so far from the natural world, from space, from everything we see out in the cosmos, there is no other intelligent life out there. There's no radio waves. There's no communications. I mean, there's some sketchy signals that we get, but most of them can be explained away by natural phenomenon. So we know that we're pumping out radio waves. We're a fairly primitive civilization, not even a Kardashev one civilization, which I'll get into uh, later on down the road. But there's, there's unfortunately two components to how we have to look at how life would emerge in the first place anywhere on this planet. The first is, are there the right ingredients? You know, do we have uh, everything that we need to make a life form? And the second is, how do you assemble those ingredients into a functioning, reproducing, metabolizing organism? So in order to address how life would emerge in the first place, we, we only have a sample size of one. And when we look at all other interstellar bodies, they're barren. They don't have life. They're not settled with people. They're not settled with organisms. Like we thought back in the day, there were actual people on the moon because we saw, uh, I don't know. We just saw a reflection of the earth in the sky and assumed, okay, people must live up there. And nope, no atmosphere, no life, not even a microbe. And same thing with Mars. We thought there was life there, that we thought there were tunnels on Mars. This one guy saw tunnels. Everybody started seeing tunnels. Turns out natural phenomenon. Put a rover, two rovers, three rovers on Mars. You don't find life. So the Fermi paradox um, is it essentially, it's very common now. You see guys like Isaac Arthur covering it. You see guys um, that I've covered on this channel, like in the uh, Future Unity episode. There's guys like Melody Sheep that tease with the idea, but it's probably one of the most popular concepts in science fiction because it's a conundrum that should not exist. According to the materialist, evolutionist, secular doctrine that we find in academia, life emerged on planet Earth through a process known as abiogenesis. That one way or another, the right ingredients plus an energy source created everything we know. And that from the moment of creation, evolution took over as a process that allowed all life on this planet to eventually become what it is now. And they're like, oh, for billions of years, it was just cellular organisms. And then it transformed suddenly into multicellular organisms. Then they became more complex. And then there was this process in the Cambrian, pre-Cambrian. They love to stretch it out as long as, you know, as long as possible to make it seem less miraculous. But just within a 10 million year span, we see every single body plan that we've ever seen from any animal ever. And we see these repeated cycles of ecosystem collapse and then spontaneous radiation and recovery at these intermittent events that we can see in the fossil record, those mass extinctions. And we assume that that same process must take place. Statistically speaking, the likelihood of this happening is it approaches one. The, the incidence of life happening approaches one, even though it's super miraculous for all the necessary ingredients to make a life form just spontaneously arranging themselves out of uh, nothing with, with no impetus, no design, no focus. We then see that this same logic is applied to other plants. And then we assume, oh, the universe must be settled with life. Even by our statistical assumptions, there should at least be two or three other uh, civilizations that are at our level in the universe at least two or three life should appear on at least um, a few thousand different worlds. Cause they're like, Oh, well there's billions of stars in the Milky way galaxy and there's billions of stars um, 
in all these other galaxies. And around every single star, there's at least going to be a couple rocky planets, and maybe one of those is in a habitable zone. And they break it down like, okay, you know, right type of star. So it can't be like, you know, nothing too massive that puts out too much radiation, nothing too small that won't, you know, um, has to be in the Goldilocks zone, the right place in the orbit to receive enough solar radiation to support life, not too much to be scorched, not too little to be frozen. And then it has to be essentially having all the right ingredients, all these factors that are in place that the earth had. And when you look at everything that had to fall into place to make life what it is from where our moon is and the influence that gravity has in tides, what tides, uh, how tides affect weather, how tides affect organisms and their life history. You think about atmospheric composition, like even 0.001% of hydrogen sulfide would have killed off most life. Like it would, it would actually exterminate us. Um, if our CO2 levels drop to, uh, drop by, you know, cause CO2 makes up point, what is it? 0.003% of our atmosphere, 0.03% of our atmosphere. And if it falls to like 0.02% of our atmosphere, uh, you see a mass die off of plants. Life is incredibly, incredibly fragile. If we had a more eccentric orbit around our star, you would also probably not have life. And they openly admit this, like as, as smug as they seem to be about knowing the origins of life, they fully admit that they have no idea about the Fermi paradox. So um, I'm going to jump into what this blog is saying. And as you well know, um, almost all the results that I grab are from pop science. And what I define as pop science is any sort of scientific take, um, whether it be an article or a video or some sort of other media that will appear at the front page of search engines. Uh, yes, it is a justification for me being a bit lazy in my research, but I also source um, almost everything I say that isn't like just a straight opinion with actual articles. Um, one of them is the Pasteur experiment. And I'm going to explain after I discuss the Fermi paradox, what Pasteur's experiment means for science, why it's one of the most important experiments in all of biology and the natural sciences in general. But let's start with what is a Fermi paradox? Where are all the aliens? So this is by Kate Loans, fact checked by the editors of Encyclopedia Britannica. So yeah, I don't know. Let's just, let's just roll with this. On a clear night, staring up at the stars induces a sense of simultaneous wonder and insignificance. Humanity, time and time again, finds itself lost amid the vastness of the universe that we are still struggling to understand. So across all the billions of light years of star sky above us, could we possibly be the only life? So Francis Drake developed a mathematical equation to solve it, which is all of this stuff. So this is just multiplying probabilities, like the equation aimed to find the number of n of intelligent civilization within the boundaries held by the subsequent factors. Not my bad. Uh, R is the rate at the formation of stars that could potentially allow for the de development of intelligent life and planets nearby. F of P, or P of F, my bad. P of F is the fraction of said stars that actually have planetary systems. Uh, so N sub E uh, is the number of planets in the solar system with environment that could sustain life. F sub L uh, is the fraction of said planets that do sustain life. F sub I is the fraction of life sustaining planets which there is intelligent life. So how you can statistically get that F, um, F sub C is the fraction of intelligent civilizations that have survived long enough to develop communication technology to send signals. And L is the length of time these civilizations emit these signals before ceasing to exist. So as you can see, one of the first things you notice about this is there's a lot of assumption. And the greatest assumption is that you can actually put a number on any of these when your sample size is only one. And in my opinion, that's pretty shoddy science. Like you can't just show up and be like, okay, I've done one experiment and I have tested exactly one variable. So let me tell you how this all works. It's like, I don't know. It's a bit of a stretch that you could actually get any of these numbers within reason. The commonly cited numbers for these variables simplify the equation to n equals 10 times 1 half times 2 times 1 times uh, 0 0.1 times 
uh, 0.1 times L, which simplifies further to N equals L divided by 10. So we've been broadcast since 1974. So according to this equation, even with these cease to exist as species in 2074, there will be 10 intelligent civilizations in our galaxy alone. So 10. So I said one or two or three, um, but it should be 10. So this is the, the so this is the fact checked science. And I trust Botanica more than I trust uh, Wikipedia. So, I mean, they're fact checkers. I mean, this is what they're saying. I, I try my best to get the best takes from the pop scientists, but this seems to be pretty par for the course. I, I kind of, I, I trust that this is fairly on when it comes to uh, the assessment. I personally thought that it would be like two or three, but if they're saying it should be 10, then we'll go with that. So scientists use the Kardashev scale. So earlier I said, like I mentioned that we're not even a Kardashev one civilization. Um, so, you know, are we even advanced enough to be able to detect foreign civilizations? And do we have the actual apparatuses or apparati to detect them if they do exist? Maybe they don't emit radio waves, maybe their technology is considerably advanced and we need sensitive equipment to detect them. So the Kardashev scale just represents how much you can basically utilize the energy of your star. So it says here, type one civilizations are able to use all the energy available on their home planet. Um, so scientists think we're currently at point zero uh, or 0 0.7. Honestly, we're just cavemen. We don't even, we don't even have nuclear fusion. We're not even close to this. Uh, full type one being about a century off. Type two civilizations can control and channel all the energy of their host star. And type three civilizations have access to power equivalent that that their host galaxy. Many scientists were convinced there must be a plethora of intelligent civilizations sprinkled across the galaxy. And that included our own planets, by the way. That being, there's still people who think that there's life like in the ice caps of Mars and stuff. And I'll get to panspermia later because that's a, that's a big loophole they use um, to get around the, the complications, let's just say, of life independently emerging on all these different planets. But again, I'm not... Uh, making this introduction of the Fermi paradox solely to be a downer and kind of like crap all over the idea of there being life on other planets. I'm just being honest. Um, I'm not trying to get anybody's hopes up. I'm not trying to intentionally get people to blindly jump into the concept like all these other guys. They're trying to give a rational explanation to that which is utterly irrational and goes against all observed, um, all observed data. So it was until lunchtime conversation between astrophysicists that doubt was cast upon the old theories. So story goes that in 1950, Enrico Fermi and his colleagues were discussing the existence of alien life over lunch. The question that Fermi asked, um, asked the table became infamous in its simplicity, quote unquote, where is everybody? The room fell silent because, well, nobody had an answer. Uh, there, there is an answer. It's that there is nobody. And we didn't have any data of anybody like he just asked the hard hitting question that everyone already knew the answer to. It's like, we haven't detected any intelligent life. There should be 10 intelligent civilizations broadcasting their signals. And there's been billions of years for them for, to emerge. So you would think that even if they had already lived and died out, we'd still be getting bathed in their uh, communications. Either they're that old, maybe they haven't emerged yet, but there should be like 10. The room fell silent because no one had an answer. Originally, the question was meant to attack the idea of interstellar travel, the possibility of which Fermi wasn't confident in. But the question remains, if there were civilizations scattered across the stars by the billions, why haven't we heard from him? It is these questions, the Drake equation, and the Kardashev scale that the true paradox was born. The Milky Way is about 10 billion years old and 100,000 light years across. If aliens had spaceships that could travel at 1% the speed of light, the galaxy could have already been colonized 1,000 times. Why haven't we heard from any other life? The, that very question is the Fermi paradox. It has sparked numerous explanations for the si uh, silence we've been experiencing. So here we go, fresh takes. Some scientists think the si uh, silence is a product of something they could have coined the great filter, an evolutionary wall. So evolutionary wall, because walls exist in evolution apparently, impermeable to most life. For these scientists, there are two basic possibilities regarding the great filter. It's either behind us or in front of us. If it's behind us, scientists speculated that it may have occurred a creation itself with the jump from single cell prokaryotes to multicellular eukaryotes. 
either way implies that we are a rare case and that communication isn't happening because we're one of the few, if any, survivors. If the great filter is ahead of us, on the other hand, they were not receiving communication because advanced civilizations have hit the wall and ceased to exist, implying that we too will hit the wall eventually, like, I don't know, middle-aged housewives or something. Other scientists have come up with the explanations for this literal radio silence. Um, I'm going to say this. And again, when you talk about an evolutionary wall, what it means is that something in your development is unable to overcome the obstacle that prevents them from getting to a state where they can broadcast themselves out into the universe. But radiation signals from other stars, they could be garbled. It could go through however many vast light years of space. And even if space is very, 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 very empty, it ain't that empty. What happens to it after it goes through a random drifting dust cloud? What happens if it bounces off a rogue planet? What happens if it hits some interstellar intergalactic ice and hits us? I mean, all kinds of things can happen to a signal from a civilization that's just sufficiently far away. Our radio waves haven't even permeated a fraction of the galaxy. Our, our, our radio transmissions from since 1976 I mean, dog, it's, it's, it's 100,000 light years across, and yet we've only been pumping radio waves into space for 50 years. They've only traveled 50 light years in any given direction. Direction. So unless there was just life on Proxima Centauri or something, nobody's even going to hear of us. It won't be tens, hundreds of, it'll be tens of thousands of years before anybody will even know about us. If the, by the time the entire galaxy is aware of our presence through our garbled ass radio waves, it could have come from a star or some sort of quasar weird planet, whatever. Signs would be like, oh, we're, we're going to be long dead or have already begun colonizing larger chunks of space. And by the time they hear of us once, they'll hear everything else over time. It's, it's hard to even say if another planet was on the other side of the galaxy, even if it was just further down on the arm. Like as again, 50 light years in comparison to a hundred thousand. Yeah. Uh, so e even a planet that's just closer to the core, like let's say it's a little bit off from the core. If it's 150 light years away, it has not heard of us. If it's a thousand light years away, it hasn't heard of us. We're just as invisible to, to them as they are to us. So one aspect of the paradox is simply scale, time, things of that nature. But given the time scale of the universe, life should have emerged somewhere else, abiogenetically or abio, through abiogenesis and randomly assemble itself and became intelligent. And from then on, we could go and do our thing. The Fermi paradox, the evolutionary wall and the great filter all boil down to one simple concept. These scientists have completely and utterly glossed over the fundamental flaw in all of their rationale that causes the great filter, that causes the Fermi paradox. The great filter is abiogenesis. They said even here, the act of creation itself. What does that mean? So if it's the creation of life itself, that's the great filter. They're basically just saying in a roundabout way that life emerging in the first place is the great filter. That life itself existing in, at all is miraculous. So we're being given all of this affair because scientists have made an assumption that doesn't hold up to logic or observation. If, a bio, if life could randomly emerge and assemble itself from nothing, then we would see life all over the universe. We would see civilizations come and go. This, this galaxy would be like the Star Wars galaxy. It would have been grim darked three, four billion years ago. But where are my Eldar dog? Where's my Jukari? I don't see no orcs up in here. There ain't no Necron tomb worlds in this, in this system. Where's Abaddon the Despoiler? I, I don't see any of this, bro. 
I don't see any of this. Where's Coruscant? I, 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 no, no Cumanopolis is here. Don't know. So one of the reasons that I started off with the Fermi paradox, I have to start with the Fermi paradox, because if I go into xenobiology, uh, xenobiology, you got to understand it's all speculation. We don't know what alien life really would look like. It could be silicon based, it could be carbon based, it could be energy based. We don't know what life may look like on other planets, if life can have a diversity of forms, or if we just basically put things into one slot, like life that's like us is the only life. I mean, we have even have a hard time calling viruses living and they reproduce and they invade host cells and they obviously are living because they're not inanimate. If they were inanimate, then they would just be particles floating around, but they're not inanimate. For me, animation, is a pretty good litmus test for if something's alive. It's either inanimate or it's animate. And people are like, oh, well, it, it needs a host cell to live. I'm like, you need a host planet to live, dumbass. Like, just just because, oh, yeah, my, my white blood cells can't survive outside of my body. Therefore, they're not living. Like, that's the most retarded. Well, it's the same logic they use for abortion. So I guess you can't fault them for trying to reapply the same uh, useless logic to two places. But that's another conversation for another series but i'm just going to explain really quickly the pasteur experiments because ignoring one of the most foundational experiments in all of biology is how we got here abiogenesis is a meme and as i've already mentioned before in previous uh series installments videos podcasts whatever you want to call them abiogenesis already has been disproven by louis pasteur yeah the same guy that uh pioneered boiling milk so it didn't make you sick it's this guy, because what he found out is that, say you take the same ingredients as perfect as broth, like nutrient broth, and it, it has all the things that bacteria, fungus need to survive, love it. So he, so we got all these flasks, he got one bent, bent in ass shape, and he boiled both of the flasks to kill any living ma matter in the liquid. The sterile broths were left to sit at room temperature and exposed to the air in their open mouth flasks. After several weeks, Pasteur observed that the broth in the straight neck flask was discolored and cloudy, while the broth in the curved neck flask had not changed. He concluded that germs were in the air um, and they were able to fall unobstructed down the straight neck flask and contaminate the broth. The other flask, however, trapped germs in its curved neck, preventing them from reaching the broth, which never changed color or became cloudy. If spontaneous generation had been a real phenomenon, Pasteur argued the broth of the curb neck flask would have eventually become reinfected because the germs would have spontaneously generated, but the curb neck, neck flask never became infected, indicating that germs could only come from other germs. Pasteur's experiments has all the hallmarks of modern scientific inquiry. It begins with the hypothesis and tests the hypothesis using a carefully controlled experiment. This same process, based on the same logical sequence of steps, has been employed by scientists for nearly 150 years. Over time, these steps have evolved into an ide idealized methodology that we now know as a scientific method. After several weeks, Pasteur observed that the broth in the straight neck flask was discolored and cloudy, while the broth in the curved neck flask had not changed. For further context, there are sealed flasks from Pasteur that to this very day still have not spontaneously generated bugs. And I have quoted the Pasteur experiment before. But what did Louis Pasteur tell us? One of the most foundational experiments in all of scientific literature. And it's all about life begetting life. Only life can beget life. Spontaneous generation is a myth. Abiogenesis is spontaneous generation. People love to cope and seethe about this and make up all kinds of excuses but spontaneous generation and abiogenesis are identical. Abiogenesis is to spontaneous generation what abortion or, or some or like what is it? Capital punishment is to murder or something. It's like you're just euphemizing it. It's like no, I'm not killing the fetus or killing the unborn baby. I'm aborting the fetus, terminating the pregnancy. It, you're not. Um, I'm not strangling the 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 convict. I am executing the uh, what delinquent or whatever. It's like you'll use euphemisms to cover 
or very uncomfortable situations that you don't really want to describe in an honest and straightforward way. And language has always used euphemism to appeal to the more polite side of the audience. It's like quasi political correctness. But in this incidence, the reason that these euphemisms are used is for political purposes, because there is an agenda at work when you think about why do people want to shill things like the Fermi paradox? Because instead of casting doubt onto the fundamental mechanism by which these people say all life emerged, instead cast doubt onto the physicists. Like, oh yeah, let's go to the physicists, bro. It isn't the biologists that are completely full of crap. It, it's just the physicists. It must be their equation, da da da. But it's like, no, the the great filter that you're talking about, the big, the big stink in everything that you're doing right now is right there. Why do you think that abiogenesis is a thing? We've never been able to create life in a lab abiogenetically or abiogenesisly. I don't know the adjective to use for that, but via the means of abiogenesis, we have never created life in a lab. We've done, we tried time and time again, but spontaneous generation does not happen. And so we get to the next quandary. We get to the next one in search of panspermia. So what's panspermia? Early Earth, like early Mars, and no doubt many other planets, was bombarded by meteorites and comet. Could they have arrived with living micros inside of them? So I know what you're thinking. Almost first and for foremost, you're kind of wondering, okay, so where, if life came from meteors and stuff, then how did it get on the meteor? But hear me out. When scientists approach, approach the question of how life began on Earth or elsewhere, their efforts generally involve attempts to understand how non-biological molecules bonded, became increasingly complex, and eventually reached the point where they could replicate or use sources of energy to make things happen. Ultimately, of course, life needed both. So researchers have been working some time to understand this very long and winding process and some have thought to make synthetic life out of selected components and energy. Newsflash, this did not work. Some starting processes have been made in both of the endeavors, but many unexplained mysteries remain at the heart of the processes, as in, we haven't been able to create life in a lab. And nobody's expecting the origin of life on Earth or elsewhere to be fully understood anytime soon. Basically, what they're saying is we try to create life synthetically, and it did not work. We've tried for decades to create life synthetically through spontaneous generation by mixing together all the right ingredients and shocking it and stirring it and coughing on it, or can't do that because you're looking for microbes, but it's like they've been doing everything they can. They, they can't do it. You're not God. You're not a deity. You're not 10,000 years advanced in the future. The idea that with our modern technology, we people have so much hubris over modern technology. It's wonderful. It's amazing. It's far beyond whatever we've achieved in the past. But all this molecular analysis, this people think that our instruments are so advanced and so infallible. And it's not true. You'll never be able to create life. It's, I, if they ever create life in a lab, ironically, all it will do by the time we get that advanced, all it will do is basically prove that intelligent design was basically how we got here. Or it'll give credence to the idea that like, okay, maybe life was put on this earth through a colonization event of some sort, or it came from some deep galactic something, or that there's some prophecy at work and humanity's caught. It's who knows, who knows? But what we do know right now is that there's nobody there. To further complicate the picture, the history of early Earth is one of extreme heat caused by meteorite bombardment. So we have zero real evidence of this besides craters on the moon, which is like all the craters that have ever hit the moon ever, because it just doesn't, it's the, the great bombardment is not proven either. We don't have any evidence in the in the crust for that, because all that crust material basically has already been cycled underneath the earth due to tectonic shifting. So all of that original plate from that early earth is gone besides a few shields in Africa or maybe Asia. 
we just don't have rock material from that far back to really decisively prove this. So the meteor bombardment idea, yeah, not sold on it. Not, not, it's another one of those where they just predict the past with very little evidence to go off of, or they interpret the evidence one way, like, oh, there's all of these meteorite holes in the moon because there was one time where the moon was just constantly bombarded with meteorites instead of, oh, the moon's been around for like three, three and a half billion years and every single anything that hits it is going to be remaining there forever because it doesn't have an atmosphere, it doesn't have wind. I like to think that a billion years is a long enough time to explain why there's a bunch of holes in the moon. I mean, if Earth's hit by Mount Everest-sized meteors and stuff and it's not that rare of an occurrence to get hit by it i mean the moon doesn't even have an atmosphere to whittle down the rocks even a modestly sized asteroid something the size of a van is going to tear a huge chunk in the moon so it's not that much of a stretch for me personally the idea that there was no great bombardment that we just kind of made that shit up but let me see to further complicate, so the enormous impact of some four and a half billion years of Mars-sized planet that became our moon. Oh, so that's the other one. The idea that like with zero evidence whatsoever, the idea that just, oh, the, the Earth and the moon have are comprised of similar materials. So instead of forming at the same time around each other, uh, they think that Earth was struck by a Mars-sized planet, didn't somehow get blown up because it was a glancing blow but somehow collided with a Mars-sized planet and we both, we weren't obliterated by that. And the moon became the moon because of that. It like drifted off. It's like the same mechanism that would have led to the moon could easily be explained by the formation of the solar system. Like the earth forms first, the moon forms next to it out of the same material and they orbit one another or the moon was caught in, they formed next to each other and the moon just went into orbit around the earth. Like it's very stable. The moon is moving away from the earth at like a centimeter a year or something. And basically it won't even drift away from earth's orbit until the heat death of the universe, which is another thing that they predict, which totally is gonna come true. Can't predict the weather two weeks in advance, but you're gonna predict the heat death of the universe, which Again, apparently controversial takes. It got me in trouble last time I said it. So as a result, many early Earth researchers think the planet was uninhabitable until about 4 billion years ago. Yet some argue signs of life 3.8 billion years ago have been detected in the rock record. Life forms certainly present 3.5 billion years ago. Considering the painfully slow pace of early evolution, the planet, after all, supported only single-celled life for several billion years before multicellular life emerged. Some researchers, researchers are skeptical about the likelihood of DNA-based life evolving in the relatively short window between when the Earth became cool enough to support life and the earliest evidence of actual life. So life emerged not even half a billion years after the oceans formed, which statistically speaking is incredible. It should have taken life even by the most progressive, liberal-minded, spontaneous generating scientist like 3 billion years for life to randomly assemble itself out of nucleic acids and phospholipids and everything else needed to make life happen. Just the idea that life could emerge that quickly. It's insane because it's a huge amount of time, but like this statistical likelihood of forming life this way, not even in a lab setting, just like out it's borderline because it's spontaneous generation. It's like, We've never seen life just randomly emerge. It, all science is against the idea that life is just going to randomly show up. And yet it did. So they think that, so what else, from a scientific as opposed to religious perspective, might have set the motion the process that made life out of non-life? So this is a, as, as this sentence implies, this is basically materialist cope. They don't want to take a religious perspective. So they're going to form, pull, basically pull something out of their ass in terms of, keeping it secular. And I'm not saying that you have to adopt a religious view of the beginnings of life, but you're not going to get a scientific one. You're not going to get a scientific one. That's all I'm going to say. There's nothing scientific about abiogenesis and there's nothing scientific about thinking that 
life just randomly emerged from nothing. I should have gotten a beer. I have tea instead because I'm a square. But there's no scientific take on this because the scientific take is that life doesn't just come out of nowhere, dog. One of the earliest and most groundbreaking scientific experiments to have ever occurred disproved disproved abiogenesis and spontaneous generation. One long considered yet generally quickly dismissed answer is getting new attention. Uh, it's not new attention. It's not getting new attention. It's being shilled relentlessly like a beaten horse by every single pop scientist that I can think of. And a little more respect that what they mean is a lot more propagandized funding and a lot more professors spouting it. And it invokes panspermia, the sharing of life via meteorites from one planet to another or by uh, delivery by comet. So we have not found life on Mars. And yet the question is raised whether Earth might have been seeded by early Martian life if it existed. Mars, it has become increasingly accepted, was probably more habitable in its early period than Earth. Fair enough. But panspermia inherently could go the other way as well, or possibly even between solar system. A team of prominent scientists at MIT and Harvard are sufficiently convinced the possibility of panspermia. They have spent a decade and a fair amount of NASA and other funding. Woohoo, we finally got to the point. Good amount of funding to design and produce an instrument that could be sent to Mars to potentially detect DNA or more primitive RNA. In other words, life not only similar to that of Earth, but actually delivered long ago from Earth. It is called the Search for Extraterrestrial Genomes, or SET-G. So you're going to spend hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars of taxpayer money because you cannot come to terms with the fact that life doesn't just come from nothing. Like you're unable to change the way you think about the world. You're unable to admit that what you assumed in the past doesn't line up with what science is telling you. And instead of sitting down and having a good think about how I see and perceive the universe, the magnitude of human achievement versus what's really out there, humbling myself and understanding that we still have a long way to go before understanding the universe. No, I, we're going to build this probe and look for DNA and RNA on a barren rock. See, this is, this is why a lot of people, there's a lot of enthusiasm behind space travel, but a lot of people see it as the, the corporate racket that it truly is. I mean, it almost seems like questions like this are just precursors to legitimize funding for NASA to, oh, you know, we're going to have our little strip mine on Mars, but we're really looking for life, guys. Trust me. We're looking for panspermia, uh, the city of panspermia. We're looking for it. We're going to find that spermia. And that's basically where we're at. People willing to spend billions of dollars of taxpayer money because they can't change the way they, they see the universe, because they can't wake up and smell the coffee and understand golly gee, maybe I don't have all the answers. That can't possibly be it. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm from MIT and Harvard. Was it like Kevin Samuel says, I'm a PhD. Prominent scientists. It's like so prominent, so full of themselves. They can't even admit. It's like, oh, pause. It's, this is the level of cope. It, this is billions of dollars of cope. And it's incredible. But I want to concern myself with another possibility. So let's say I'm wrong. Let's say all my assumptions are BS. Let's say the there are 10 intelligent races out there. Where are my Eldars? They're right over there, bro. You, they're in the web way. You don't even know it. Old one's been here, bro. Old one seeded this entire planet. Uh, you know what? It's straight up Warhammer, fam. Straight up Games Workshop is Nostradamus and the entire universe is seeded with, with Grimdark and we're just these fledgling little little hatchlings like little wood ducks jumping out of a tree in a tar story down and landing head first. That's humanity. What if civilizations don't broadcast themselves to protect themselves? 
So this is something that I have quoted for myself. I know others have come up with this notion. I think specifically from what I know, I don't know in science fiction where this came from. I call it the demon hypothesis from those Pentagon guys who called uh, the extraterrestrials demons. Um, I pulled up the pop one, like prim primitive pop one ideas, body and spirit. So pop ones believed back in the Dizay and also maybe still today uh, that anybody who comes from outside of Papua is a spirit, not of this world and is an aberration of nature. So that's why they'll eat you because they want to absorb your mana because you're also like a spirit creature, but you're not really a human. And being white definitely did not help with those first people that showed up to Papua. So sorcery and sickness this is something I want to point out. How do we handle the unknown? What are the explanations that we give for unknown phenomena? And when it comes to the Papuans, prior to their contact with white men, the Papuans had no concept concerning the nature of disease in the human body or any idea of curative medicine. Sever severe illness causing debil uh, debility or death was attributed to malicious magic of the sorcerer as in fighting an enemy throws to spears which wound and kill. So the sorcerer, in spite of revenge, injects into the interior of the body of his victim small weapons of wood or stone which bring pain and death. The natives cannot explain this injection, but they certainly believe that he accomplishes his purpose. When the relations of a sick person notice the illness is serious, they seek the aid of a friendly sorcerer who they are willing to pay for overcoming the power of the offending magician and extracting his deadly darts. The first operation of its kind, which I witnessed, was performed on a young man who, from the description of his pain, I confused his suff from suffering with uh, pleurisy. With accompanying incantations, the sorcerer started on his task by filling the affected part of the body in order to locate the intruding articles. He then seized with his thumb and finger a portion of the skin and gave a sudden jerk upwards, at the same time loosening his grip. Holding his arm out stiffly as if he was carefully carrying something, he turned and walked along the path for a short distance away from the patient. Suddenly, he stooped and, thrusting his hand down smartly, he snatched a small piece of stick out of the dust in the ground. Turning around, he held up the stick for the sick man to see and then threw it away. Standing beside the sorcerer as he did this, I said to him, you picked up a stick out of the path. He said, no, I did not. When I drew it out of his body, it came between my thumb and finger and went into my shoulder. As I dashed my hand down where the stick came down through my arm and out of my hand. Come see me get another. I watched him repeat his trick a number of times without any variation in his actions. He noticed that each time he held up a stick, the patient gave a deep sigh of relief. And at the end of the operation, he declared that his pain was gone. Whether the sorcerer was guilty of self-deception, I had no means of learning, but the satisfactory ending of the operation demonstrates clearly the triumph of mind over matter. So why did I mention this? The mindset of an alien race, the power of the human mind is incredible. The placebo effect, sorcery, the blessing, curses, these all have massive impacts on people in real ways that we can't explain. We know, statistically speaking, the power of placebo. We know that people who think they're dying may actually waste away and die and have nothing wrong with them. We know people who think that they've been miraculously cured, even if they haven't been cured, will suddenly recover just because their mindset changes. One's will to live, one's perception of things actively alters the world around us, and especially yourself. So you got to think, if the human mind is this powerful, what about an alien mind? What about an alien mind that's greater than ours, more intelligent or more perceptive? What, what would that mean? What it would mean is that there might be aliens that experience all the emotions that humans do, or maybe half the emotions that humans do, but in a greater way. So... If these aliens think that there's, it, we're curious, we're also arrogant, we're also bellicose. We want to know if there's aliens out there because we're curious. But are they curious? The demon hypothesis basically postulates that alien civilizations, no matter how advanced they may be, might inherently be terrified of alien life. The idea that other creatures from other worlds that they don't know about, which they have no concept of knowing where they might be, how many of them there might, it, it might absolutely terrify a civilization. 
we don't care because we have such a smug sense of superiority. We think that anything that will come down from the stars, we'll just shoot at it and shoot missiles. We already have all these films like War of the World and Independence Day and Mandalorian or something, whatever. It's We all have ideas of what aliens would look like from the xenomorph to the predator to all those weird things from Adventure Time. We have all of these ideas of what extraterrestrial, extra-dimensional beings might be. And yeah, we are still, even then, afraid of creatures like that. And we always have been instinctively. The only reason we don't think this way anymore, what if a civilization, what if a civilization became even more terrified? Like, think about how secular we've gone should we be afraid of the unknown? Like, should we actually be wary of what's out there? Maybe it would be prudent not to be broadcasting all of our signals out in the space. You you don't know if there's some world eater on the prowl and everyone's staying silent because the galaxy is being haunted by this thing. Like a Kardashev three civilization that we don't, we don't know that we're in the middle of a civilization. Maybe they don't even care about us. Maybe we're irrelevant. We're like some primitive life form and they have some edict not to mess with us. There's all kinds of reasons, but maybe it's fear. Do you want to really be the first race to contact humans? Like we know how first contact typically goes in his, in history. Do you want to take the risk of potentially running into a much more advanced, much more aggressive, like imagine if you run into a species that's completely predatory, like they're you social ants or something, but they gain sentience and they just go around devouring worlds ravenously. Do you want to risk that as first contact? You don't know. You don't know if they're going to be the fluffy marshmallow people or the ravenous slavers or just a bunch of dumb, dumb orc tier dudes riding in their beatneck spaceships or some hyper advanced uh, pre diluvian Babylon tier civilization that can beam itself all throughout the multi cosmos. And you just don't know what you're dealing with. So maybe most civilizations err on the side of caution. Maybe the great filter is one of sanity. Only insane aliens would want to broadcast their location willy nilly to anybody who was out there. It takes a level of arrogance and naivety to even want to do that in the first place. Like why risk it? Like maybe the universe is not as tame as we think it is. So looking at the pop wins, we know that mindset is key. Mindset is a key way of understanding what what a civilization, what a people might collectively end up doing. Maybe it's just not, maybe they just don't care about life in the universe. Or maybe they just come to the logical conclusion, oh, we know it's so special that life emerges. We're probably alone, so we're not even gonna bother looking. If we find life, then whatever, cool. It's like the difference, it's like dating. It's some guys take the idea of like, oh, if I find a girl that's nice, then cool, whatever, whatever. Other guys are desperately and aggressively looking for a girlfriend. That's the basic. We're the thirsty simps of the cosmos looking out and desperately. We're trying to advertise ourselves to the world or to the cosmos, to the galaxy. And maybe the others just aren't, aren't, aren't bothered. Maybe they think, you know, oh, man, Earth is post wall. They, they've already hit the wall. Mm. You know, not for me. I, w- I want a younger civilization. Well, that's a bit more fertile. Like, look at those birth rates, terrible birth rates. But uh, but jokes aside, the Fermi paradox is very easy to explain. And I think that the overcomplication of the subject stems from a lack of wanting to admit to the bitter truths about abiogenesis, about how life emerged on Earth in the first place. But we got to think about, like, let's say from a fictional sense, we know about like Bill Beridian's like alien biosphere series. We know about all this speculative zoology and speculative biology, most of which I kind of hate because they re-envision future animals as these weird, grotesque forms when most of the time what we see from animals is the inhabitation of predetermined niches. Very rare will we see new niches open up and animals fill these novel niches. Like our niches have been pretty well established for a long, long time. And it takes ecosystem systems to be in place, different types of species that are able to achieve these forms to to emerge. 
and I just don't I just don't think that most are realistic like the whole flying fish become airborne and they they're flying through the sky like that kind of stuff or I, I do like the uh I do like the anomaly like the future bats wasn't that show called anomaly I think so but they had those future bats that were predators I like that I, I like the giant predatory bats uh reminded me of priest I, I think that priest came out after that show though but pastor basically proves so let's say that life on earth so i'm gonna start off i'm gonna roll with the punches i'm actually gonna roll with the punches i'm gonna say and i'm gonna build off this series with the idea of panspermia so let's assume based on what we've talked about before about evolution magical shape-shifting animals and stuff so let's say that um, the path of earth the path of every single life bearing planet is is being shepherded by uh a lmaos that there's an alien race or alien colony and that's what all these ufos are and their entire purpose is to shepherd humanity their entire purpose is to guide the human race down its own path to help it avoid the great filter maybe we're just an experiment a giant cosmic experiment by a ship three civilization so let's imagine that I'm, I'm not trying to, unlike my critique through history, I'm first critiquing the current dogma and I'm going to supplant it with something where even if we go with their thinking, let's assume that that's how, how things work here. So a Kardashev three civilization is creating life in all these different worlds. It's seeding life. They're like the, again, like the old ones from 40K, like the precursors of Halo. Like, I don't know. They're just doing their thing. If we make this assumption, we got to see how life would actually emerge on different planets. And we're going to pick different classes of planets out of all the types that exist. So we have our typical stone worlds. Um, we have our ASEAN worlds. You have gas worlds. You have continental planets. And basically, there's not really many other types of planets that would realistically harbor life. But we're still going to try and see what kind of life might emerge on these different types of planets. So this was so this is just going to be an hour long, but I'm going to basically go in this direction. My second installment is going to mostly focus on the types of planets that we think that we think might harbor life because there's certain limitations to the idea of of life but also a lot of potential so life can theoretically emerge anywhere if the physics check out so if there's a mechanism for metabol a metabolism reproduction self-organization to maintain homeostasis etc then life can emerge on almost any world it could be a fiery hellhole it could be a gas giant it could be an ice planet it could be an high sea and ocean planet it could be super big super small um but as long as there is a loop, as long as there is some string of logic allowing this to happen, then it can theoretically happen anywhere. Uh, alien biospheres may produce life that for one reason or another cannot advance far enough to reach into space. And that's something I kind of put down as a note to remind myself that what a biosphere is, is any in, in, intertwined system of habitat, and organisms in that habitat that function in a cohesive way to harbor more life or to support the life that is currently within it. So it's a balance. A biosphere is a culmination of biomes, which are a culmination of ecosystems, which are a culmination of different communities, baseline plants, fungi, bacteria, multicellular organisms of all forms. I mean, from animals to oxygen, the biosphere is made up of multiple organic and inorganic parts, both the living and the non-living, and it's very cyclical. Biospheres can be very complex, but the ultimate goal of, an, of, a, of a biosphere, and the reason we still have a biosphere is because it perpetuates life. So we got to think about like what kind of plants would perpetuate life. But there's also the temporal aspect. Again, we've only kind of processed our signals about 50 
light years in either direction. So our ideas will change as we discover more worlds, stars, systems in general. We're going to get a better idea of how the universe looks and the different classes of planets that there actually are. But just like with the filters, I mean, if life emerges on a planet that's too big, like let's say it's 15 times the size of Earth, then you're not going to get a rocket ship off that. In fact, if you even make it slightly larger, if you add Earth and Mars together at their current masses, Earth would be almost basically too big to launch rockets off of. There would be no SpaceX, there'd be no NASA, you couldn't get to the moon, couldn't get to orbit. It's just too big. Then what about a civilization that's trapped under ice? What if it's an ice world and there's a subterranean ocean or just an ocean layer? It emerges in almost total darkness. You could be super duper complex. It could t like think psycho um, psionically or telepathically, whatever. But unless they discover how to teleport, unless they discover how to beam themselves out in the space or drill through the ice surrounding their heads, which might happen, might take them way longer than what we're doing though. So we, they might be a compare, they might be a bunch of squid people living under 1200 kilometers of ice. And by the time we're out here colonizing the stars, learning about this, it might take them another thousand years to gain the technology, to actually get through their ice sheet, survive outside of their, of their high pressure watery environment. It's, it's, it's the idea of if at the center of every planet, there was a stargate that allowed them to instantly go to other worlds. And we're just sitting here like, why in the hell would we drill to the center of the earth? We can't even drill through the crust. We can't even get to the mantle. It's too hot. It's too rough on our equipment. And we're not even sure if there's anything like there. We don't even, we don't, we're not assured of there being a stargate in the center of the planet. What if we go there and there's nothing. We, we just go, it's super hot and sucks. And why, like, why would the cost be worth it? And they must think the same thing about drilling through the ice above them and going into space. Like, why would we do that? Why would we do that? Like, even if we know that, oh, okay, well, logically speaking, like maybe the ice goes on forever. How long are they willing to dig to test that theory? Like if there's 1200 kilometers worth of ice, above their heads, they drill 200 kilometers. Like, look, bro, we're 200 kilometers in. And we don't know if this is like, are we just going to keep doing this generation after generation delusionally? So maybe the great filter is just logic. Maybe we don't know what this great filter is. Uh, if it's not a biogenesis, there's all kinds of ways that a civilization won't be able to make it to space. There's all kinds of things in place that make it impractical for a civilization to emerge. You could have life appear on a fiery gas giant super close to its star and life emerges in this soup and it becomes hyper complex, but it's so hyper complex that it doesn't make the logical jump to try to go to other worlds. Like, why would I do that? Why would I go to another world if my own world's just fine? Hard, hard take. You can see is delayed gratification, but what if you're an organism that can't survive in space at all? Like the accommodations still allow you to survive in space just don't work. Like what if there is, so what if you need these high temperatures to survive and that makes space exploration unfeasible, utter lack of habitable worlds or an inability to properly store yourself long-term on, on spaceships. You can't live in prefabs. Like what if you're hyper advanced, but there's some aspect of your biology that prevents you from interstellar traveling effectively. You have to then invent a technology that allows you to overcome that for us. We're like, oh, we'll put ourselves in stasis pods or upload ourselves to machines cool beans, but then you have to give yourself enough time for all these other civilizations to hear you. And that might be impossible. So there's a lot of questions to answer. And I'm going to go through each type of planet. I'm going to go through each type of planet and I'm going to explore the xenozoology of every single planetary class that we know of. And it's going to be a tall order. I'm basically going to cover one by one and I'm going to make these about hour, maybe an hour and a half, but I probably about an hour long podcast on each one. And they're each going to explain what kind of life may emerge there. How would it get to space? That's ultimately what we're trying to get to. How, how would these civilizations, if they're pan spermed, if, if we, if, if everything's been pan spermed by the old ones, the precursors or the Prometheans or whatever, how would they get to space? 
how would all these different forms of life get to space? If you're if you're some penguin species from an ocean world, how would you, how do you get into space? So this is the Fermi explanation. A biogenesis is a meme, but we're going to roll with it anyways. So with that, folks, welcome to Xenozoology, and I hope you join me for future installments. Next drop is probably going to be, I, I want to continue going on with my Triassic critiques, but yeah, my schedule is really bent. So I'm streaming this on, uh, what, a Monday? So yeah, my normal Saturday night uploads, kind of difficult right now. So hope to catch you guys soon. Probably, I might drop something this weekend. I have to see, I have family visiting, well, I'm visiting family and they're visiting me. So I have to think about when I'm actually going to be up in Adam. It's probably going to be next week, probably next Monday. Mondays are a really good time, but might be Tuesdays as well. Might be Thursdays, but yeah, the weekends are really tough for me right now. So I'll catch you guys later. It's either going to be Triassic or it's going to be more of this. And it might be more of this. The Triassic, there's a lot of research. It's, it's hard to find reliable sources on the origins of dinosaurs and the origins of pterosaurs. And I, I covered that cursorially in the first installment for the lower Triassic, but there's so little actual data that it's like the exact polar opposite problem I had for the Permian, where it's like you're just bombarded with all this data from the Permian, but at the same time, like nothing's really conclusive. You don't really know. And then with the Triassic, it's like, oh yeah, we very conclusively have nothing. We very conclusively have no effing idea of uh, of, of where dinosaurs and pterosaurs and stuff come from. So just, just take my word for it, bro. And yeah, it makes getting to the rest of tri the Triassic going to be a slog, but I, I think I want to take a different approach for the Jurassic, definitely. And definitely for the upper Triassic. Like, I want the focus to be more on how dinosaurs are changing and how dinosaurs are magically shape-shifting and not just the broad general ideas of evolution like I've been focusing on. I, I've done a lot of bedrock stuff already. And if you want to get that bedrock stuff, then you're going to have to basically just watch from the beginning of the series. Because I'm, I'm just not going to reiterate the same talking points over and over again every single video so the focus is going to be more on uh tracking the development of dinosaurs and pseudosuchians and all these different lineages in the triassic and then also the the proto mammals that just magically died out even though there's no reason for them to die out they they die out and we don't have a reason really for their extinction why they disappear in the tri in uh in the late triassic where they had survived the Permian, but they couldn't survive that. So yeah, a lot of mysteries in the Triassic, a lot of research to do. So I might take the easy route and nurse it, make sure I have a quality product before releasing and just can kind of continue with this here. Cause there's so much, this is just pure speculation based off of pre-established knowledge of what we know. So this is a lot easier to make content for trying to thoroughly research the anatomical differences of mid triassic archosaurs is pain and suffering if i'm not getting paid to do it it's just one of those hobbyist things where it's like oh man i spent an entire weekend learning about one clade and i have to talk about all these different types of animals and i i went down it's, it just takes so much time to research this is why people write dissertations and and get doctorates and stuff from this because the amount of work it takes to actually give out a quality product on something like the origins of archosaurs and terrors. It's, it's really legitimately like PhD tier work. And this is just a, a meme obscure YouTube channel. So yeah, I'm probably going to do what I can with that series. I'm not giving it up. Of course, it's like the bedrock of what I think is the bedrock of the channel but I want to move in a new direction as well that explores more what it would be like if these people were right, what things would realistically look like and still taking the Fermi paradox to its logical conclusions. And also just being realistic about what xenozoology would probably become in the future as a field. So thinking about these things, not from a ho-hum, I'm just going to poke holes in it and nitpick and be a dick perspective, but also from the perspective of, okay, let's think rationally about how this field will evolve in the future. So that's my main goal, guys. I hope you've enjoyed the first installment of Xenozoology. 
Uh, I'm your host, Afro Whoologist, and I hope to see you guys next time. So, yeah, like, subscribe, do your thing, fam. I'm really grateful for everybody who decided to uh, subscribe recently, tune into the last videos. Y'all have been great. So take care.